I'd like to welcome, I'm David Zucker, I'm the assistant to the moderator, Tim Bulger. I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the kind of complexes, the playground for people who think. My first of all, I'd like to, uh, I'd, I'd like to start our policies with no personal attacks, and we have one fool at a time. Uh, <laughs> number two. Here at, the, here at the restaurant, we're going to charge everyone a three dollar fee to defray the sub college tuition fees of the college place expenses. In addition to that, we want to continue to meet here. The restaurant has to make some money off of us, they're not in business for their health, and so everyone's going to be required to purchase something for dinner or something at least something to eat and or drink. All right, our format is as follows. Well, make sure you can hear them, you're drifting off. I'm holding you up to my mouth. What one do you want? Okay, that's just, just, just finish. Finish. All right. You don't do that. Second of all, uh, maybe you don't do that, Charlie. I do. All right. Now, with regard to uh, in regard to our format, first of all, we are trying to have a payback. Our coordinator is going to deliver, is going to talk about our upcoming topics. Second, once he's finished, we will have additional announcements of neighborhood or community interest. Those must be announcements, no speeches. Next, I will introduce our speaker. We will talk for about an hour or so on the on the evening's topic. Then once the um, pro, once the speaker is finished, we will have questions and answers. This is right, Jeopardy. All questions must be in that form. No speech. <laughs> then we will have our have our, re, our rebuttal session. Then you can talk about whatever you want for the better portion of time that Tim allots. And you can rebut the speaker, or you can talk about whatever you want. And then the speaker will get the last word. And then the restaurant closes the o'clock. So we're going to shut things down at a quarter to eight. All right, Charlie. All right. Welcome to meeting number. This is how you're supposed to talk. Welcome to meeting number 3710 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, now I'll abbreviate things because we're running a little bit late here tonight. Uh, first of all, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We are, we are commencing on our uh, Eco Month special series of speakers. Eco Month at the college. Okay, uh, I can see that we've got our uh, speakers here tonight. Um, and um, for next week, uh, on April the 8th, uh, we're going to have the Illinois team for passage of the Earth Bill. And we're going to have an open mic. And why do you think, or how do you think, what should be done regarding climate change? Uh, if you think oh, something should okay. be done, yeah. what should be done? You get five to 10 minutes each. And after the keynote speakers, to give us a little bit on the Earth Bill, very important piece of legislation. On April the 15th, Dan Weinberg will talk about capitalism and soil, how the soil is being depleted for profit. April 29th, uh, April 22nd, then, here's Julie Charles Pedock, I have a solution for traffic and cars in Chicago, a definitive. Well thought out plan if executed will improve the lives of everyone in the city of Chicago. Wow. Not easy to do, but I did it. April um, 29th is open at the moment. We have a couple of things we're looking at. May the 6th, we were looking for someone to speak for May Day speaker on the condition of organized labor. I'll let you know how we do on that. <coughs> May the 13th. Uh, we're having someone from our satellite campus 
this is an excellent uh, presentation. I've sat through it, and she's going to talk about economic democracy. There is not the kind you vote, and it is voting stuff. This is socioeconomic democracy, which we presently do not have anywhere in the United States. On May the 20th, our own Jonathan Martin, college regular, um, he says these kids, him and his pals, want to um, arrest all the war criminals. All of them. All of them, all the war criminals. Worldwide. And him and his pals are going to put them in jail. So Worldwide he's got a plan, he says. He says, I got a plan. All right, that's all. Thank you very much. Let's listen to the program since we're running late. Tim, all right? All right. Uh... All right, let me unshare the screen here. All right. Uh, all right, Jen, you got an announcement? I've got, I, I've got two announcements. On April 13th, David Kraft will be our expert at night with the experts. He will be discussing nuclear issues in Illinois. And uh, that's at 7 p.m. And you can uh, access that program by going to um, NEIS uh, at NEIS.org. That's David's email and ask him for an invitation. And then on April 27th, which is our regular meeting, we're going to have Kevin Camp speak about the transportation of nuclear packages. That's it. Okay. On person or in Zoom or both? Uh, no, they're all on Zoom. We don't have in person. Okay. Any more announcements? All right, hearing none, your tonight's speaker is Kelly London of Nuclewatch, working for a nuclear free future, the nuclear threat in Ukraine, and at home, why nuclear energy cannot solve the ecological crisis and what you can do here in Illinois. Give it up, please, for Kelly London. Okay. All right, Kelly, you're on. Go ahead and share screen. You okay, thank you. I don't know if there's any way I can see the people that are there at Dappers. I'm looking at a microphone. Anyway, you've already had enough technical complications, so. Well, so. Uh, well, well, well I'll, I'll shine it on myself. <laughs> anyway, I think all these technical difficulties were just a bad April Fool's joke. So sorry it was on you this afternoon. Oh yeah, April Fool's with traffic too, you know. Oh yeah. It doesn't take an hour. And 20 minutes from Charlie usually, it's usually about 15 to 20. I think they must have had something not Wrigley Field. Anyway, Polish, sorry about that, Kelly. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I'm gonna be, um, uh, be on our way. Go ahead, okay. go ahead yours. Um, my name is Kelly Lundeen. I live in what is called Northwestern Wisconsin in Luck. Uh, is where I work. It's on land of the ans um, ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe Ojibwe. I use the personal pronouns she, her. Um, I work at Nuke Watch. So Nuke Watch is an organization that's been around for since 1979. Um, we've done several campaigns since then. Um, a lot of them were before I was involved because I was only born two years before Nuke Watch got started. But uh, we, as I was speaking with Charlie over the past few weeks, I realized that, he, well, he, we found out that he was involved in one of our previous campaigns, which was the track watch, where um, teams of volunteers around the country were um, volunteering to uh, watch and monitor uh, rail shipments, secret rail shipments of radioactive waste. Um, so that's one of the things that one of the projects that Nukewatch has been involved in in the 1980s, we mapped um, the entire fleet of intercontinental ballistic missiles in the United States, 1,000. We um, traveled out literally to every single one so that because up until that point, those were all um, secret locations. And um, we published them in a book and so that people could go out and say, hey, this there's a there's a nuclear weapon in my backyard. That means I am potentially a target because 
those are one are going to be one of the first places it's taken out if the U.S. is is attacked. Is those those intercontinental ballistic missiles? Um, so today I'm here to talk about um, the nuclear threat in Ukraine, and it's not just one threat; it's two nuclear threats, um, and then also discuss that more at home. Um, relevant to the um, ecological crisis we're facing. Um, so I will share this now. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Nuclear threat in Ukraine at home and at home, and why nuclear energy cannot solve the ecological crisis. This is a Nukwatch web Nukwatch website, nukwatchinfo.org. I'll put up the um, website again at the end. So, um, yeah, as I said, I live northwestern Wisconsin. I am a mother of three, which gives me a great opportunity to watch lots of cartoons. And yes, I know I said I was here to talk about Ukraine, but cartoons have a lot to say about, about nuclear weapons. Um, and it's something that we don't, we don't realize because we see it so often that it, it has no meaning anymore. Um, the image that you're looking at is from a, a movie that came out about four years ago called Boss Baby, which is hilarious. And if you have kids, especially if you have more than one, you should watch it. Um, but this is the image that most people get of a, a mushroom cloud. So I'm starting off talking about nuclear weapons here um, and what happens when there's a detonation of a nuclear weapon. The image that we have of a nuclear weapon mushroom cloud is something that makes it look like it is far away. It is something that has been so normalized for us, this image that we don't even realize it when we see it anymore. It's the maximum visual effect of our anger. And it's something that we know that whatever, whatever is, we, is happening there, it's far away, it's not going to affect us. The people there do not have a face. They're not real people. And it's something that after that weapon goes off, says this is done. Um, so I want to give you another perspective on the mushroom cloud. It's from my friend Yukio Kawano, who I work with in a group called the Affected Nuclear Affected uh, Affect, <laughs> Affected Communities and Allies Working Group for a Nuclear Free Future. Um, Yukio is um, a teacher and an artist. She works with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and her grandparents were survivors of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. She was born and raised in Hiroshima. These are her words. The image of the mushroom cloud is taken from overhead. It gives a bird's eye view that coincides with the image taken by a US military aircraft from the sky of the mushroom cloud rising from the Hiroshima atomic bomb is that an image that instantly offers viewers a safe space to assume that the photographer or military personnel has all the possible means to escape and minimize their exposure to radiation? Such a view was never offered for the people who were at ground level in Nagasaki or Hiroshima on those days in 1945. The U.S. bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki instantly took the lives of every living being in their proximity. The mushroom cloud shape cloud, the mushroom shaped cloud that arose from the detonation was an accumulation of the ash of the city itself. That cloud contains our grandparents' flesh and bones. Those are the words of Yukio Kawano. So a lot of younger people 
don't have um, the same fear that an older generation does that lived through um, the Cold War of what if some if 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 nuclear weapons go off again? What what happened under the mushroom cloud that Yukio is talking about is real. The people were real. The United States government of my grandparents' generation dropped that bomb on the Japanese people of Yukio's grandparents' generation. That mushroom cloud has consequences. If we're just gonna look at the some numbers and statistics, um, a limited level nuclear exchange, if it were to occur be, between the United States and, and Russia, um, studies have shown that there would be an immediate death toll of 125 million. Um, and then that's including the longer effects of a nuclear winter, which um, after, the, after the impact lofts soot into the air, it blocks out the light, preventing people worldwide from be, being able to grow crops and producing a, nucle a famine, a nuclear winter famine, and also the radiation from the fallout. Now, if there were a full-scale nuclear exchange, it would eliminate three quarters of the world's population. So that's the sobering um, effects of, of what the nuclear threat it looks like in any, any um, war conflict between two nuclear powers. The mushroom cloud from 1945 in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or anywhere for that matter, any of the tests that have been done, the effects are not done. They've had consequences. Yukio, Yukio's mother, Kuniko, died too young from cancer. Yukio's uncle, Makio, died of an aggressive thyroid cancer. And Yukio herself often sits through meetings um, with a migraine, and she's unable to finish meetings that we're in um, for our group. These are all things that are uh, um, very well known to be caused by radiation exposure. Um, so I'm gonna share this again. So the nuclear threat in Ukraine is a twin nuclear threat. We have two oh, or more nuclear weapons states that are involved in this conflict. So we have the threat of nuclear weapons being used in a war and we have nuclear power reactors in a war zone and that's the first time that's happened. And I would venture to say that one threat is as grave as the other. Um, so you can see by the two maps over here, we have on the left, we have the nuclear reactors in Ukraine. Zaporizhia has six nuclear reactors. There are 15 total. Um, and on the right side, you can see, um, let's see here, right here is Ukraine. The green is the Russian, um, nuclear weapons. Red is uh, U.S. Um, I don't know if many of you are aware that the U.S. still has nuclear weapons deployed in other people's countries. Uh, we have the French arsenal over here in Britain. Um, so they're surrounded by nuclear weapons. Wow. Is there anything you need me to do, Kelly, or are you having trouble nope. with your screen? No, nope, it's just, oh, okay, my button came up now. Okay. Nope, thank you. 
um, Russia and Ukraine, of all countries in the world, should know the results of accidents from at a nuclear power plant, having experienced Chernobyl 37 years ago. And there are um, what there are effects. There's still a 1,000 mile exclusion zone. There are um, there are wild boar. There are mushrooms that are too radioactive to eat in that area. There are things that, um, there, there's something called Chernobyl heart, which is one of the effects that was, that occurred after the Chernobyl accident um, to young infants being born. There were stillbirths, thyroid cancers, birth defects, leukemia. And while some people say that the um, death toll was 31 people in Chernobyl. It's at least 4,000, which is a number that the World Health Organization expert panel um, uh, came out with in a study, and that was in 2006. So having nuclear reactors in a war zone is extremely dangerous. Um, and the difference between a nuclear bomb being dropped and an accident at a reactor is that uh, a bomb being dropped happens all at once. And at, the re at, a, at a reactor, um, the radiation um, is spilled all over and that radiation is resuspended every time there's a fire. It's resuspended, it goes through the water cycle and falls again and again on the people and the surrounding area. Um, and, I, and I'm not meaning to downplay at all the tragedies at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but just the, the fact is there were 200 times more radiation released in Chernobyl than at Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Um, I'm sharing some information um, that I've learned from Linda Pence Gunter in one of her presentations she works with Beyond Nuclear. So nuclear power is nothing to be played with. All of these um, plants in, um, in Ukraine should be shut down right now, considering the, the high risk. Um, so I'm going to talk more now about nuclear power in the United States. Now that I've talked about the, the threat, nuclear threat in Ukraine. Nuclear power, I believe, is unsafe. Um, nuclear power relies on, currently on, um, Uranium. Uranium mining is very dangerous, and um, people talk about if you if you talk about removing from fossil fuels and um, obviously uh, a lot of coal miners had to deal with lung cancer, but you should talk to a uranium miner or anyone who's lived around um, any of the abandoned uranium mines. Um, I'm just showing you a graphic here from the Radiation Monitoring Project um, with some data that I'll read. Oh, shoot, I went ahead of one. I'll go back just a second. Okay, uranium mimics hormone, the hormone estrogen and calcium, replacing nourishing calcium with radioactive uranium. It can take years for inhaled uranium to leave the lungs. Ingested uranium will end up in the bone, kidneys, and liver, but can be absorbed faster in a newborn's digestive system. That's why it's more dangerous for um, infants, for pregnant women, um, and it's also more dangerous to girls for any um, exposure to radiation.
Can you see the? I have a box over the top. I'm just wondering, I have a question. I have a box over the top of my my PowerPoint. Are you able to see the whole image there? I can't hear you, Carol. I think so. We can see, we can see the whole image, don't worry. Okay. Okay. You can see the whole image and it's just, you, you can move your box over with your mouse if you want to. It should be able then to, it, to the Then it moves the slides ahead if I oh, okay. touch anything. But anyway, so it says problems with nuclear power. So one of the first and most pressing problems with nuclear power is are the environmental justice issues. The uranium mining, we have over 500 abandoned uranium mines just on the Navajo Nation um, in the United States here. And radioactive waste storage, nearly all, if not all, of the proposals of where we are going to store the radioactive waste from producing weapons or um, waste from the commercial production of nuclear power um, have been on lands belonging to, to Native people. Um, there's no solution for the radioactive waste. We have currently 90,000 metric tons in the United States and nobody wants it, of course. Nobody wants it where it's been produced at the reactors and where people have actually been able to take advantage of the energy. And nobody wants it at the proposals, the proposed locations where that, uh, where, where that have been proposed for that um, to be stored. Um, the proposals have been Yucca Mountain and the current proposals are called Consolidated Interim Storage, CIS. <clears throat> They're both in the, there are two proposals in Texas and New Mexico, and the people there don't want that. In New Mexico, they've never been able to even take advantage of the, the power produced by nuclear energy. And here, the rest of the United States, we've been enjoying our nuclear electricity and now we're gonna dump it on New, uh, New Mexico or Texas. Another problem with nuclear power, um, you can see more, um, more than 60 studies have shown increases of childhood leukemia around nuclear facilities worldwide. And the United States has deliberately um, shunned doing tests or studies to find out more about that. Okay. And now to move on to nuclear energy as a solution to the climate crisis. Um, nuclear is not something that is capable of solving the climate crisis for various reasons. One of the strongest being that it cannot be deployed fast enough to replace or transition from fossil fuel production by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change deadline of 2030 for transforming our entire energy system. Um, I have a quote at the bottom of this slide that was actually a few years old. It's a few years old um, before we already had quite an increase in production of renewable energy. But this said, back when we were trying to do um, a transition within the next 40 years, we would have to replace the existing 400 nuclear plants in the world and build an additional 1,600. That would mean building three nuclear plants um, every 30 days for the next 40 years. And by that time, climate change will have run its course for us. Um, and that's over 40 years. So now that we're actually looking at what seven years is the most recent deadline we've been given by the UN, um, it's obviously not anything that we can, um, we can count on being ready in time. Um, all right, just throw that in there for April Fools. We have dependence on fossil, fu uh, fossil fuels we're trying to get rid of and nuclear power is just not going to be a solution. Um, <clears throat> so nuclear cannot solve the climate crisis. Um, and we need to look at it more holistically as an ecological crisis, not just the climate crisis. Because if we're just looking at um, CO2, then yeah, nuclear might look good. 
but we're not looking at all of the other problems, the environmental justice issues and the radioactive waste storage issues. Um, so there are a few more reasons that it cannot solve the climate crisis. Each reactor requires 100,000 gallons a day to cool the reactors. We need cool water, not heated water of our future world. We know the world is heating up, the water is heating up, everything's heating up, there's not gonna be cold water. Um, and um, in 2018, when heat waves crossed Europe, um, four nuclear reactors had to be shut down in France and one in Sweden. Several other reactors had to be reduced production due to the rivers um, where they get the water to cool the reactor were heating up in temperature and they weren't cool enough to cool the reactor and that leads to a meltdown. Um, so um, right now we're already having a, a crisis with our uh, the amount of clean water in France. Um, they were up to about 75% of their electricity coming from coming from nuclear power and they 40% of their fresh water is used to cool reactors. Um, another issue with nuclear not being able to withstand the climate crisis is sea level rise. In 2020, there was a report by Moody's Investor Service that over half of the United States, the US nuclear reactor generating capacity was facing growing credit risks in the next 10 to 20 years due to flooding, hurricanes, heat stress, and other predicted impacts of climate change. So nuclear power is a technology that won't be able to withstand climate change, and it won't be ready in time for um, replacing the, the current production by fossil fuels. Um, now, there have been a lot of there's been a lot of talk of advanced nuclear uh, power reactors. They are also known as small modular nuclear reactors, and there are, there are several different designs. Um, there was one approved. Uh, the first one has been approved in January. But again, these uh, face a lot of the same problems that the conventional um, current nuclear uh, power fleet we have. So if we have um, this one design that was approved in January, um, I believe in 2030 or so, it's expected to, could potentially be operational. Um, but um, that's one design that's been approved. Um, the nuclear reactors the, of the current fleet that have been approved and have become operational, I'm just gonna give you the timeline. The last few that have become operational are um, 1996, 2016, and we had one, um, it, it's not operational yet, it's reached its initial criticality, so it hasn't actually begun producing electricity yet, but 2023. So since 1996, uh, 20, for 27 years, we've had three nuclear reactors come online. Um, so it's just not promising that it's going to be able to roll it out fast enough. And especially with new designs, because the new designs are working through the research and development and um, beginning operation is when the worst nuclear um, accidents happen. Um, there's going to be a big learning curve for these. Um, a study that was that um, just came out in the past few months um, looked at water cooled, molten salt cooled, and sodium cooled small nuclear modular reactor designs. They would generate two to 32 times more radioactive waste per unit of electricity generated than our current nuclear reactors. So that includes the thorium um, reactors. And right now, if we're if we have ninety thousand metric tons of nuclear waste, imagine what it, what's going to happen if we start creating more from a new kind of reactor. Um, in Illinois, um, there's 
you've had to pay a $3.05 billion of ratepayer funded bailouts for the current nuclear fleet to, to get to this point and continue to run. Um, so I wanna, I'm just gonna highlight a few things. So I, like I said, I'm living in Wisconsin. I know that there's a lot going on in Illinois. I think you have more reactors than any other state. Um, so there, I have a few things that um, you all can be a part of, things that you can do. Um, in Illinois, you can oppose the repeal of the moratorium on construction of new nuclear power reactors. There are two bill numbers here, HR 1079 and SB 76, those are state bills. You can oppose the small modular nuclear reactors, which is really one of the things driving this um, new uh, attempt at nuclear renaissance. So those are re um, about regarding nuclear power. Um, and then also there's a nationwide, um, nationwide effort to <coughs> encourage the United States. This is about nuclear weapons. Um, to get the United States to abolish nuclear weapons. Well, it sounds like a very far off pipe dream. Um, it's all start somewhere. And um, in 2017, the UN adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's a nuclear weapons ban treaty. And cities around the United States are writing um, uh, resolutions. So, and I don't know if in Chicago or in smaller towns around Chicago or in Illinois, how many there are, but it's a growing movement. And I'm gonna um, show you an, a group you can work with on that if that's something you're interested. Also nationally, people can oppose the Consolidated Interim Storage and Yucca Mountain proposals. The Consolidated Interim Storage is what I was saying before the CIS. Um, and your legislators, um, federal legislators know about those. And then in order to support the nuclear ban treaty on weapons, um, there is a House Resolution 77, which calls on the United States to embrace the nuclear ban treaty. And then, so here's some more information of um, some resources that I've either mentioned or, um, or have a lot of good information. Um, Nuke Watch is my organization. The Nuclear Ban Treaty Collaborative is the nation one of the one of the groups in the United States working to get the United States to um, ban nuclear weapons. Um, and some of it's similar to the Freeze Movement, which ended up being an extremely effective movement. Um, the working on national um, on radioactive waste issues is the National Radioactive Waste Coalition. Um, locally in Chicago, you have the Nuclear Energy Information Service, which Jan was mentioning before. Um, and Jan, is there anything that you would want, or or Stephanie, anyone else from NEIS that would like to add anything else that um, folks in Illinois can um, do? Besides, Jan did mention at the beginning. Jan, do you want to announce that again in case somebody wasn't here? Um, well, um, we have our night with the experts every month, but this month we're having two because the issues in Illinois have, Illinois have become so prominent that we need to have a night with the experts on Illinois issues. And this will be April 13th at 7 p.m. And David Kraft will be our expert. Um, so the, one thing you can do is come to our night with the experts meeting and find out what's going on. Okay. Um, the other thing is the Illinois Congressional um, in Springfield, they're on a recess right now. They go back to work the week of April 16th, both houses, different days. Uh, this legislation in the Senate uh, 70, SB 76 passed the Senate. Now it goes back to the House uh, for, uh, we hope that it gets voted down. So it would be great if people would call their Illinois reps and ask them to cast a no vote 
for uh, that uh, Senate Bill SB 76 that uh, removes the moratorium on building nuclear reactors. Okay, thanks. Uh, everybody, everybody needs to know the the name of their state senator and the name of their state rep, uh, because if you call your state senator, it carries a lot more weight than if I call your state senator. My state senator is voting uh, against rescinding the moratorium. He he's voting that to keep the moratorium, and uh, so is my rep. But uh, there's other people who need, well, let me just give you an example. And when I, I was in Springfield lobbying the representatives and one rep, when he took our information, you know, we were giving him literature. He said, thank you so much. I need this to present my side of the case because almost everybody does not understand that the state reps and the state senators don't really know what a ponderous uh, issue this is and how much it's going to affect the future of Illinois. That's all Thank I had. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, there's great work being done in, in down there with um, nuclear Energy Information Service. So I wanted to highlight their work um, so people can get involved and work together. Um, another organization I quoted a, a, in this um, presentation was Beyond Nuclear, and they have an incredible amount of information on their website. Um, and so um, if there's a way I can make this uh, PowerPoint available to people. And then I also wanted to just show some of the other um, sources of information. Um, Yukio Kawano is an artist I mentioned before. Um, and then these are where some of I, some of the information that I got. I also forgot to highlight the Navajo birth cohort study when I was showing the image um, by the radiation monitoring project. Um, the information that they collected um, was showing how um, even 20, over 20 years after the last uranium mine is closed, there is elevated levels of radioactive uranium in um, infants being born now. So one or two generations later, it's, that's just the uranium. That's not, that's not the, um, that's not the the high level radioactive waste, that's just the uranium and it's producing delayed brain development, language um, development delays, um, serious things that these populations are dealing with, especially the Navajo and other people in the area where we've done a lot of uranium mining in the United States. Um, okay, and the other thing I forgot to mention is, I said a lot of um, things that I, I'm against, um, and I forgot to mention renewable energy. I do believe that there are, um, there have been, there's more than one um, proposal. There are different proposals for how renewable energy can um, be, be deployed worldwide. It will, it's different in every area. The needs are different, um, but, we can, it can be done. There's been um, uh, Mark Jacobson of Stanford University, the Rocky Mountain Institute, they have proposals, they have ways that this can be done. So I forgot to mention that. And um, that's all for now. So I will take questions and um, or arguments or whatever. <laughs> Tim, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Hello? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Is that you? 
Yeah, hi. Can you yeah. think? Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on the phone. Can you hear me now? Thank you for your talk. Um, yeah, I've heard about the ITPNW, the, the International Treaty on the, on the uh, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, how, where, I mean, my question is, where in the treaty, uh, how in the treaty is, how do you enforce the treaty? What mechanism is there to enforce it? Well, that is definitely it's a, it's a it's a United Nations treaty, so right. So that you know potentially could be a, a flaw, um, and it's uh, all of those have not been decided actually. the The first meeting of states parties um, in the UN regarding this treaty, called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons occurred yeah. last June. And the second treat, uh, meeting will be this November, December in New York. So they're working out all those details, but yeah, that's, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Um, right. I can look all into right. it and I can um, let you know if I have a better answer than that. Okay, because yeah, with it, without an enforcement mechanism, it doesn't really mean anything. If the United it, States is is behind it, um, they they'll enforce anything they're behind, whether it's there or not, or risk or not. What I Jan? don't, I don't or, think the the countries with the nuclear bombs have signed it. No. Oh no 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 no. Of course no, they not. They're they have actively a, they opposing have a, it. They have a, no. And there's 20 articles. I mean, and maybe a different, uh, maybe something. More recent has been written up, but the paperwork I have, it listed 20 articles. So it's not, you know, just, you know, 10 sentences about, you know, who, how they would enforce it. Okay, uh, David, who's next? Who is next to a question? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Grab the mic from, grab the mic from, uh, David, we'll just take it up there and go ahead and go. Right, right, right up. We'll, we'll ask the questions from the podium, so go ahead. Stick it right in it. See that little thing there right in the, no, no, you can go right in, right there. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, could you go over some basic steps of how we can reduce our consumption now in mass to send the message uh, basically from ourselves to ourselves that uh, our energy needs are not as big as we often uh, assume that they are. So we just have a realization that to live frugally is a lot more feasible that a lot of people assume it is because of the propaganda from the fossil fuel industry. And I very much uh, appreciate uh, you, your talk this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't have a step-by-step -step answer. I know that individually, all of us can reduce our consumption of fossil fuels, but we are not the major perpetrators of, of, of carbon emissions or of ecological um, crisis. We, we we aren't get, we aren't being given the choices. Um, this has to happen at a at a much larger um, scale, uh, the government scale. And um, you know when when COVID hit, all the planes were downed, and the the air cleared in places that had not been able to see the other side of town for years. Um, you know it can happen. People can make it happen. Um, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we said, oh, we're going to stop buying fossil fuels from Russia. Europe said, we're going to stop buying fossil fuels from Russia. And um, so there are ways that this can happen. I, I don't think that we should be blaming ourselves, except to the extent that we can be active in promoting a, a, a renewable future and and reducing our, I mean, everyone can reduce our, our our consumption, but I don't think that we're the big culprits. It's it's um 
the fossil fuel industry that uh, is part of who runs our government. The um, so they they don't want that to happen. All right. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Jake. Go ahead. Yeah. A quick follow up to that. Um, you know, for this meeting tonight, many of us took public transit, and uh, I just think it's a good thing to have a national dialogue in the United States that we need to uh, overcome our addiction to the uh, motor vehicles that we think we have to have. All right. God. Charlie, okay, Charlie, you're next, and then we'll go to Jan Bodar. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, if the speaker sends me a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, we maintain a, a web page to the collection of those, and I can put links to it. You can find the uh, thing there uh, on our on our page, main page of the college website. Uh, it's a, a collection. Of PowerPoint presentations that speakers have done. But my specific question is I've had occasion to study the history of aviation. And needless to say, among the inventions that man has come up with in order to fly, less than 50% were successful. Now we are being told that they're going to develop a new type of nuclear reactor. And what little I know from observations and research, a nuclear reactor is perhaps one of the most, if not the most complex device or piece of machinery ever to devise by mankind. And they claim that they can turn it on and it's going to run with no problem and there won't be any accidents. Do you have any data or information of the probability that a brand new nuclear reactor is likely to explode? I don't have any data on that. Um, it's definitely a lot of uh, explode. I um so you mean like to have a a meltdown where there would be uh, no function oh the, um and I, I don't i don't think anyone would say even in the nuclear industry i don't think they would say that there aren't going to be hiccups and problems but well, um, does it every week who does the thorium guys oh yeah. okay they, yeah they turn it on it's going to work perfectly and even if it malfunctions no big deal, it'll just slowly turn, slow down, and shut off, and everything will be like, okay. That's because he doesn't understand what's going on. Yeah, with I don't understand this. I'm too stupid. No, you're just biased. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get into that in the rebuttals. All right, uh, Jen, go ahead. What's your question? Oh. <clears throat> Well, I, as usual, I just kind of have an affirmation. Every time I see an explosion on television from the Ukraine war or any other uh, thing that's going on internationally uh, as far as war goes, I think, well, there goes my carbon footprint for five years right there in an instant in that explosion. So when Kelly says, we're not the main culprits, she couldn't be more right because you and I are not the ones that are causing the problem. Okay, uh, Jake, is that you? Oh. Yeah, hi, hi. I just want to, I just want to provide a, provide another answer to a question from a previous speaker, um, which is the, the question of, of saving energy. Um, simple answer. Uh, we can use financial incentives to do so. In other words, just an example that I know about: you go into you go into one of those big grocery stores and look up at the ceiling, and what do you see? Rows and rows of uh, rows and rows of tube lighting, right? So, Jewel Corporation did this little experiment in about half of the Chicago area stores. 
they installed uh, reflectors on the, in strategic places on the ceiling, and they took out two, half of the tomb lights. And with the reflectors in place, they got approximately the same amount of brightness. And each store that they tried it in, they, they saved about $1,000 per month per store on their electric bill. So that, that's, that's a financial incentive to save energy. And what that translates into is that much less electricity that has to be generated. Who else has a question? Who else has a question? Anyone else have a question? Come on up. I got another one. Now come on up, and we'll get off the. Go ahead, Matt. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go and he's going, he's going. Go ahead. I have a question. Why is it each time they shut down the reactor? actually is replaced with dirtier fuel producing more carbon not less when germany shut down their their nuclear plants they went to using dirty brown coal yeah right. brown. one step forward ten steps backwards Let's take any question okay kelly you want to answer um i just i I think that there's a lot, if we were investing the amount of money we were investing in nuclear and putting it into renewables, this just wouldn't be a question at all. This wouldn't be a, an issue at all. Um, uh, renewables are ready right now. And um, the, the people who are running the country, and I'm not talking about the, not talking about the politicians, I'm talking about the, the multinational corporations, they don't want that to happen. And um, so renewables can, can take care of this problem and we don't need as, um, Mark Jacobson, he's one of the, um, people I mentioned earlier who has ways we can move to right now to renewable and get there in time. He has a book and the name of the book just says it all. It's called no miracles needed. We don't need, um, miracles, except we need real investment in renewables. All right, Andy, you got the next question. Yeah, uh, I, are you familiar with uh, the work of Rocky Mountain Institute uh, talking about the nationwide programs to decarbonize, decarbon, decarbonization of America and uh, cut fuel in half by 2030? Yeah, I did mention them earlier as one of the groups that has real solutions. So yes. Yeah, a, a recent report came out, an update of what we were just talking about. Uh, in, the, in the year of 2022, solar and wind power for the first time in America produced more energy than all nuclear and coal. That's one thing. And solar and wind are growing exponentially. So, and I, uh, and Charlie had a question, and I, I, I'd like to add an answer to that. Uh, the the uh, safety record, what you can expect. <clears throat> the nuclear power industry said that we only had a thousand years worth of reactor service. So with a thousand reactors running on American soil, they thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year in exchange for cheap electricity for the rest of the so yeah, Charlie's absolutely right. Uh, in 1980, they found out as you go up in complexity, the nuclear power plants, you get to a point where you cannot accurately predict what kind of accidents you have. And that's just one disaster after another, unforeseen, unknown, waiting to happen. That's one of the reasons that there, there's no, no, no future for nuclear power there. Okay. Dan, you've got a question, go ahead. Dan, you're next. Okay, my question is, has the U.S. government ever done anything about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Have they ever said they're sorry or helped out cleaning up or right. cleaning up their mess that they made? No? Um, President Obama went to Hiroshima. Um, I think he stopped short from apologizing. Um, and and then and then during his term, they passed the largest investment in nuclear weapons ever, almost two trillion dollars. 
um, which is to modernize our the nuclear weapons fleet we have. Um, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what the United States did was horrendous. We sent over scientists and they said they were gonna be helping the people, the survivors, and they were studying them. The same thing they did in Marshall Islands. They studied the people who were affected by, and the, and well, the Marshall Islands was officially a test. Um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are not labeled as a test, but um, they did not help the people. Um, I'm sure there, there was a, a level of um, cleanup um, of the contamination or of the city. I, I don't know exactly, but I know as far as the, the health aspects, um, there wasn't, it, it was maybe less, it was not um, helping. It was, it was just using those people as, as guinea pigs and um, lab rats. Okay, Stephanie, you got a question. Wait, I have one more follow-up question. Uh, the, the oil industry has secrets from the 80s, 70s, 60s, where they knew that oil was going to run out and they knew about global warming. Does the nuclear industry have things like that in their that hidden yeah. past? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, especially... Let, let's say, I mean, even uh, Einstein uh, admitted it was a mistake that, you know, this technology could, was going to be used for a bomb. Um, and, um, and, and, and let's say, let's say people have gone into this um, thinking it's with good intentions or, or um, we're going to stop um, a worse crime from being committed by by killing a bunch of people um the scientists knew that um they they wouldn't have known the extent they didn't understand a lot of the things that, that weren't understood was all of the how all, all of the fallout would affect people and the cancers that would be produced birth defects um at, at least until after um so a few of the bombings uh, and they did some of the tests on people and and found out what was going on in the Marshall Islands, the jellyfish babies that were being born, um, the stillbirths and horrendous things. Um, in early on, there was the the campaign for nuclear energy. They called it uh, too cheap to meter, atoms for peace. That was a public relations campaign to make it sound like. Um, we're going to have this peaceful side of nuclear um, to justify the continuation of the of the industry. Hey, Stephanie, you got your hand up. You want to ask the next question? Um, I was away from the computer for a little bit. Maybe you already mentioned it, but regarding the Price Anderson Act, did you <laughs> mention that while I was? I I didn't go ahead if you. No, no, uh, no, it just whatever you mentioned, please mention again because um, no, I missed I, it. I, no, I didn't. So, um, okay, basically, the Price Anderson Act protects the nuclear power industry from, okay, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the liability of the, of the, uh, they don't have to have insurance. Well, no, um, no, no banks or insurance oh, companies totally will so. insure them. Okay. The US go government does, though, with, with our money. Yes. So they know. <laughs> if they aren't going to buy their own insurance, then then they know what can happen. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. Yes, Kelly. Uh, there's been two nuclear actors, uh, one in the Soviet Union and one in Japan that malfunction and are continuing to malfunction. But to my understanding, um, the Fukushima is still polluting water, and Chernobyl is cooking under a sarcophagus. It would appear an inherent feature of a nuclear reactor is that if it becomes a problem, it is a problem forever. 
and you will never be able to correct the situation. Is this a correct assumption that the inherent danger of a nuclear reactor is that if it malfunctions, it will never be fixed and will cause a problem for eternity? What's your, what's your question? Yes. What's your question? Um, yes. And um, if you just look at the half lives, if you're looking at um, not just nuclear reactor, but the, the high level radioactive waste produced by producing the electricity, it's radio, it's hazardously, hazardously radioactive for millions of years. So if you want to shorten it, it might not be eternity, but at least millions of years. Okay. Um. I gotta ask you a question real quick. Can you first off, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd like to know if you're familiar with the technology of uh, of a fluoride-based nuclear power, first off, or the lifter particularly. Not the liquid, that one. The liquid fluoride thorium reactor. It's one of the um, advanced nuclear reactors. It is, but it operates in a different way. Okay. Second of all, are you familiar? And I know I asked you about this earlier. Are you familiar with the Harvard, Illinois based group, the Thorium Energy Alliance? Yes. Are you Tim? Yes, I'm Tim. Yeah, you sent me the link to their organization. So I looked through it um, through the website. And yes, yeah, so thank you for that. I was just asking what your thought, what your initial thoughts about it were. Um, so my initial thoughts are, I don't think that there is a, I, I think that it's generally has the same problems as um, con, the current um, nuclear power fleet. Um, it's, we're gonna have the problems of radioactive waste for what, like I just said, millions of years, it's hazardously radioactive. Um, and it's at a early stage in its development, even though there have been several. I don't. I don't know about that one in particular. Right. But well, um, if you just familiarize yourself with the material, because um, anyway, I'm that in my rebuttal period. Um, who mm -hmm. else has a question? Okay. Um. Um. What question did I ask? Uh, I'm not hmm. saying, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass you. Come, I'll, I'll pass you. You come back to me. Oh, um, yeah, you can come back to me. I don't remember. My, I don't remember my question now. Is it true that in Northern Europe, on some days, on ideal days, this is obviously not on every day of the year, one hundred percent of Local energy is produced by renewable energy. And is that possible in the future for us? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's happened. There have been, um, I, I, I think it was like New Year's Day, um, maybe a year or two ago, I think in Germany, they, they did an experiment and found, and they did run the entire, it was run on entire renewables. Um, I don't, that's, that's the only one that I know about. Uh, I got I got a question I got a question for you. Um, uh, what what would you what would you do uh, to replace the current uh, air the current air transport system? Um, uh, 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 airplane airplane fuel is very it's very dirty. It, it's it's kerosene. It's a light fuel and it burns very dirty. So what kind of fuel would you replace it with? That's definitely outside of my expertise. Um, <laughs> okay. I, would, I okay. would say that that's probably an area where we would have to reduce co individual consumption is, is our flights. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I, I have a question. I did, I might have missed it, but uh, how many nuclear power plants do we have active in Northern Illinois now? Do you know? Stephanie or Jan? Do you know that? 
There's 11, there are 11 active reactors in Illinois and <clears throat> they're mostly central and um, there's a map showing, uh, you could go to neis.org and there's a map showing their location and the amount of time it would take an airplane to go from O'Hare to each one of them. And in addition to the ones we have in Illinois, there are two across the lake, uh, the Cook Power Plant and Palisades. Palisades was shut down even before they planned to shut it down because uh, it was getting too dangerous and they didn't want to spend the money to fix it. So they shut it down. And now um, the federal government has offered them seven billion dollars to try to re rehabilitate it and keep it open. In Illinois, we have spent of our taxpayer money, three point, I think uh, Kelly said 3.02 billion dollars to keep our 11 nuclear power plants running because they don't, they're not economical and they're, they're getting, as they age, they're getting more and more and more expensive to maintain. And they're dangerous. Is there any place in the country where they don't have nuclear power plants and, and uranium mines and, and uh, uranium <laughs> dumps? <laughs> I was going to say New Mexico because New Mexico has no power plants, but they've got the mines and the oh. dumps. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I can show you a map um, that's on the on the website of the National Radioactive Waste Coalition. <laughs> yeah, it's not very promising. I'll just share that here real real quick. Um, okay, so the map is on the right side. I don't know if it. Oh, look at oh, that. Yeah. So it's not it's not looking too good. So this is um, reactors, okay, reactors, waste sites, and related locations. Um, but I will tell you like up here in, in the um, Great Plant Plains is where the um, intercontinental ballistic missiles are. So there are weapons up here. <laughs> um, yeah. There were some right uh, in the park near me back in the day, back when I was in college in the 60s. They said that there were, uh, you know, like missile sites right along the lakeshore here back, uh, back in the 60s. I hope they moved them out of there. <laughs> On the Great Lakes? On Lake, Lake Michigan, down here by Chicago, right by Chicago. Hmm. I, I remember yeah, I remember my question um, can you repeat the bill numbers for the nuclear moratorium in Illinois yeah I'm going to get this back up um, in the house it was bill SB76 and I think oh. if, uh, if I have my facts right that I think it goes over to the house with that same number. SB76. Um, and I'm a, who's the main sponsor? Um, I can't remember. Hey, we're, well, we're, 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 ask, we're asking our, 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 senator, our state senators and state reps to vote against it. This the would reps, rescind the moratorium, is that right? Yeah, the, yeah, the reps. Sorry, through the Senate. They, it goes to the House now. It already passed in the Senate, and now it goes okay. over to the House, who has to yay or nay it, and we're hoping okay. that they nay it. Is that the state okay. or the U.S.? This is Illinois state. in Illinois. State, state. state. So, that, so this is so the state. The, the main, the main, uh, uh, um, the main sponsor of the SB. Uh, of SB 76 is Sue Rezin, and she is the senator from Morris, Illinois, which is a whole other story because Morris, Illinois was accepting waste from all over the United States before uh, 1982. And so we've there's a bunch of waste down there that's really sitting around. It's been there a long time. and But, but that's her district. 
And then the, the House bill, the House bill was defeated in the House. Uh, and the wording of the two bills is almost identical. But I do okay. not know why once it was defeated in the House that now it's coming back from the Senate because it passed in the Senate and was defeated in the House. Hey, uh, we got done with the oh, so now we're having to go back to the House for the same bill? That's what they said. Okay. So we're, we're, ask, we're asking them to vote against it. Yes, we are. Kind of a double negative. Okay. <laughs> yes, a double negative. <laughs> Right, right, right. Who's who's the uh, who's the main sponsor in the house? Walker. He's uh, he, he's the uh, he's the representative from uh, coal country down in southern Illinois. No, I thought he was oh. from Arlington Heights. Okay. You're, right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. That's okay. Uh, we right. have another question. Right. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Kelly, could you speak to how the Green New Deal? Uh, encourages, provides, and cultivates the use of renewables in the United States if if and when it is passed. Hopefully it will be passed very soon. Uh, could you speak to that? Honestly, um, I, I don't remember what their um, position was in the end or is at this point on nuclear. Okay. I, I don't know. Does somebody, does somebody else know that? No. Okay. Was that the question? Green New Deal? Yeah, for the Green New Deal. You would suggest it be strengthened specific to that point? Uh, yeah. If, if nuclear, if they are calling nuclear renewable, then that's a big mistake. Yeah. But the well, United well, States is already... Ice cream vegetable. <laughs> okay, Charlie, go ahead. The... Uh... Green New Deal is simply a, a resolution. It is not a piece of legislation. Um, wait, 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 wait. And it is a policy position paper of wish recommendations. Uh, and it really doesn't speak, if I spoke on it here at the college, address the topic of, it's, it, of course, advances renewables, and I don't believe in any detail and even acknowledge nuclear as viable means of providing energy. Uh, given next week is when we're going to be talking about legislation uh, that is before Congress. This is House Resolution 598 that has been introduced and has been formatted as a piece of legislation uh, for enactment by the Congress of the United States regarding energy policy. So come back next week and uh, we'll find out about the Earth Bill. Thank you. Okay. Who else has a question? All right, Kelly. Let me get back up to the microphone. All right, Kelly, you're going to get the last word, but I'd like to let you sit back and relax now because now we go into our infamous rebuttal period. Who's got rebuttals tonight? One, two, three, four, okay. Five up here. How many online? Well, we'll go through it. I'm going to give everybody about five to six minutes apiece. We're going to give everybody about five to six minutes apiece since we're a little bit earlier on rebuttals right now. But, uh, I'm going to give the first one because I think it needs to be said. All right. First of all, I think you guys who are anti nuke don't really know what is actually happening with uh, nuclear power right now. I'll do this because there was a guy by the name of Alvin Weinberg who was the head of Oak Ridge National Laboratories who in the early 60s and late 70s, who was one of the co-inventors of the light water reactor, started learning about the uh, troubles that would be happening with the light water reactors. As a matter of fact, he said, uh, if we widespread these things, we're gonna have to take our political institutions long enough to which we are not well accustomed to doing. And he then provided to try to find a solution 
to what was being widely deployed as a light water reactor. What he came up with was a reactor that operates on, a, 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 on not on solid fuels, but on liquid molten salts, which basically means that it can operate at atmospheric pressure. The big problem with our present day nuclear reactors is we have to heat water to about a thousand pressurized water to about a thousand times degrees more, a thousand atmospheres more than what we normally would have to do to keep the reactors cool. And the biggest problem with the light water reactors is keeping it cool, keeping our supplies running so that we can keep the reactors cool. Now, when you get into the molten salt reactor, it operates at atmospheric pressure, which basically means that when you operate it, it doesn't need all the uh, shielding that a light water reactor would or a pressure vessel. All you would need would be the effective shielding against radiation. Oh, that's well. The way it works is that uh, there's two there's two loops of, of molten salt. One that's got their reactive agent in it, which is usually uranium-233, which is what comes when you uh, have a decay chain of thorium after bombarding it with free neutrons. It takes about 28 days. Once you get uranium-233, it's a fizzle fuel, and its byproducts will last less than 400 years. As a matter of fact, the basketball size of thorium will power the entire city of Chicago for the next 30 years. And the reactor would be about the size of this restaurant. Um, what I did when I first learned about it, I was absolutely flabbergasted. But when I started looking into the Thorium Energy Alliance website, attending some of their conventions, and actually talking to some of the engineers that were doing this thing, uh, I was absolutely and thoroughly convinced that the... Uh, liquid chloride thorium reactor had a future. We haven't done any, we, we were not doing research on it 10 years ago, but now we are. China last uh, September has a one running right now in the middle of the desert in China. And it's, they're expected to have commercial viable reactors within the next one to two years. And probably commercial viability with, with, within the next five. And then it'll be made in a factory. As a matter of fact, it's a lot simpler reactor because it operates, you have to keep that one going because it always wants to slow down and go into a state of, of uh, calm. In other words, the fuel will solidify in, in a state and it doesn't mix with the environment if there is any kind of accidents. You could lose power to these things and it would just literally shut down. On the bottom of the reactors, there's something called a freeze plug. That freeze plug is uh, usually kept uh, cool by, you know, the power, and uh, that's what makes the reactive salts and work in there. But if there is an accident or any kind of things and you lose power, it simply goes into a drain tank, or it then solidifies and becomes basically harmless to the environment. You still have that uh, radioactive pool of stuff in there, the molten salts, but that can be dealt with a lot easier than what you do with the inherent risks of the uh, present day light water reactors. What always kills me about you guys in Loop Watch, you always tell us the hassles and the hazards of what happens with the current day, present day light water reactors and not get into what is actually feasible and possible. The thing is I have read Mike Jenkinson's report and when he talks about you know, getting renewables across the country, building wind turbines, effectively about the size of a 40 story skyscraper covering the entire state of Arizona. I think that's a lot less feasible than running and commercializing these uh, thorium reactors. There's a book out by a guy by the name Richard Martin, it's called Superfuel, and he gets into the whole history of this movement. And he has therefore concluded that. Thorium is not, it's, it's going to happen. And once it's proven, we'll be seeing the widespread adaptation of these uh, Gen 4 liquid fluoride reactors. 
Now, I'm not saying it's a panacea because the renewables have done a lot better recently in, you know, bringing the price down and, you know, advanced nuclear power is not going to be useful everywhere. There's going to be a need for large scale centralized power for running of cities, for running of steel plants, for running of an advanced industrial society where we'll need a lot of power. And you can't do that on renewables. You're going to need some form of high centralized power. Why? We're going to need some. Got a grid. Uh, Charlie, you know, we may have a grid, but the thing is, that grid, what's it powered by now? Central power, a large central plant. And the thing is, you're telling us you know, you're under high pressure. How do they use water? Charlie, you don't have. You said your nuclear reactor is full. One pool at a time. How does it turn the turbine? Charlie, when you have a loop of molten salt, you have two of them. There's a second loop that gets heated by the reactor and goes through a Brayton cycle that will power the reactor. Or you could still use steam. How do I do so? Because they either use steam or they'll use a, so it's a Brayton pressure, cycle yeah. with the molten salt. It's all there, Charlie. Charlie, it's all there. And I got the documents and the source things to prove it. I've given presentations on thorium before. I think we'd be uh, throwing out the, the uh, something that really could feasibly stop to help us get off oil. Now, I'm not saying there won't be problems with waste, but a lot of that so-called nuclear waste right now can be recycled. There's a reactor up in Canada called the Can Do that will effectively burn it, turn it into new nuclear fuel, <laughs> and let it be recycled. If you go through once, about three percent of the uranium is, is is gone because it's in it's in the solid form of fuel rods, and those fuel rods are very expensive to make. Um, when you, you can get it into a liquid type type of a molten salt, you would be a lot better off doing so. Now, I'm not saying that that stuff can't be, that will have to be sequestered, but 400 years is a heck of a lot better than thousands and thousands and thousands. I'm simply saying that we'd be stupid not to check out the thorium reactors. Besides, we don't have to mine thorium. It's already there. All of your uh, precious minerals for your electric cars, your neo-molybdenum batteries, and everything else are literally dripping with thorium which right now is classified as a nuclear waste. And there's been bills in the house to start what is called a thorium bank, where they'll take the waste thorium, put it in the central repository, and then allow people to commercialize uses of thorium, which would basically then not only get our rare earth industry up and running, and then we could get our electric cars, our wind turbines, our neo-medium magnets for our earbuds, and all that, because thorium's everywhere. And if, if it's if you've got a rare earth mine, you're going to have thorium. So you don't have to mine it like you do uranium. And thorium is fertile, not fissile. To make it fissile, you have to go through a radioactive decay chain of 120 uh, and so 28 days to turn it into uranium-233, which is done in the reactor itself or with a, another blanket of molten salt in thorium. Now, I'm going to let it go there because I know my time is up. And I would not be utterly convinced of this unless I actually saw it myself, went and talked to a lot of these scientists, went and uh, said to myself, hey, is this really feasible? And from what my understanding is, it's a definite yes, and we'd be stupid if we didn't use them. Thank you. Tim, I got a question for you. So, you know, um, Jonathan, go ahead and get up there. I'll answer Jake's question. Or right, Jake. Okay. It's rebuttal yeah. time, not questions. Well, we'll, well I got a question. I got a question for you, and then I'll let it'll be brief, and then I'll let somebody else do a rebuttal. My question Jake. is, if my question is, if this is if the thorium reactors are so feasible, who's supposed to pay for them? Right now, uh, the government did a lot of research on them in. Uh, the 1960s, the uh, reports were in a uh, child's room in the, uh, in the, uh, I think they were in a, all of Alvin Weinberg's papers as well as the reports were in a 
children's daycare center in a closet until about 2010, where they were published on a website called Energy from Thorium. The Chinese came, they took a lot of that stuff, and then they real they all of a sudden took all those reports and started working with them. There's now 700 people in China working to get these reactors feasible. And they're doing it because they already got a working one that just started in uh, September of last year. Okay, Jonathan, go ahead. You, you didn't answer. You didn't answer the question. Why aren't they being used now, and who's paying for it? That isn't what I asked. What I asked is who's supposed to pay for them. Well, then once they're once they're up and commercial, they're going to be a lot cheaper than renewables. I can tell you that. Yeah, that's 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 what we heard about nuclear power plants. They're too cheap to meter. I don't uh, buy it. The thing, is, the thing is, in the present day, with the light water reactor, of course they're expensive because of the shielding. If it's ran at atmospheric pressure with molten salt, you're going to eliminate a lot of those costs, and you'll be able to do a uh, lot. Better. And they're still operating under pressure. Well, I've been operating under a lot of pressure today the with the technical power? stuff. How do, you, how do you turn a generator with low power? Charlie, you don't understand. I will have to give I you this. Don't understand how to generate electricity. I think you know how to generate electricity, but I don't think you know what the principles of the thorium reactor are. All right, yeah, you're still you still didn't answer the question. Who's supposed to pay for it? Who's supposed to pay for it? The shareholders or the or the rate payers? It's gonna be a combination of both because if we're gonna get out of this climate change scenario, it's either gonna be you're either gonna be paying for renewables or you're gonna be paying for you know electric cars or something else. The cheapest way is to get these thorium reactors running. All right, Jonathan, go ahead. You have All right, Jonathan. Hey, uh, now for the artistic part of the evening. <laughs> Just the magic acoustic guitar in the background. You know how they are here at Devers. It's too loud, it's too loud. They're always telling us it's too loud. So hopefully this isn't too loud, but uh, this is a great topic, great speakers this evening. I wish uh, we had more environmental speakers. I'm looking forward to the next couple months. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to cultivate a natural balance between us and the world. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us that we are rewarded by the knowledge that joyfully sharing ideas costs us no money at all. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to have confidence to be ourselves. Thank you, Mother Earth, to welcome each new chance to nurture a bridge which bonds us in a complex ecosystem. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to remember our roots. Self-determination is our engine. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to know ourselves so well that we are most confident when we are centered in our most radical honesty. Thank you, Mother Earth, that we are lasting friends to all who live solidarity. Thank you, Mother Earth, to be grateful for the deepest origin of our human lineage. Thank you, Mother Earth, to always remember that our souls know the true path. Thank you, Mother Earth, that it is necessary for anyone, it is unnecessary for anyone to understand the road less traveled, except one and oneself alone, when one is practicing the discipline of rejecting materialism. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us that music and art and dance and spending time outdoors to reflect and meditate, journaling, thought identifying, dream chronicling, if you will, and writing, owning the craft of expression. They are not frivolous weaknesses of self-indulgence. They are some of the fiercest and strongest aspects of our identity as global family members. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to protect our dreams by keeping the pen on the page and sharing them with you. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to embrace frugal living because we embrace sharing. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to not be afraid of simplicity. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to cherish the lessons that we have thankfully learned that is this, 
listening is just as powerful a contribution to the dialogue as talking. Learning is just as important a service to the curriculum as teaching. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to be wildly free, that our lives give hope and build strength that is needed for a better world. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us that our dreams lead us to be quick to engage in unity and welcome the most difficult parts of work that most folks honestly did not want to do yet. But that's our job as organizers, yeah. to get to the yet moment. Oh, boy. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us that our works are a lifetime of sacrifice and revolutionary love, which is our most cherished blessing. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to forge an all-inclusive path, which welcomes all to a new sense of community and global society where the gift we find is a livable planet. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to fight for a world of justice in how we live. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to respect and join in an alliance with the indigenous communities of Earth, the First Nations peoples, and honor our responsibility to pay reparations as well to heal a long history of pain, suffering, exploitation, oppression, theft, violence, rape, and genocide. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to be forever aware that there is no scoreboard for unconditional cooperation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to be careful to never forget that the past remembers us, the future roots for us, and the present calls us to serve the common good. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us each and every day to strive to be a humble example for the youth on how to live diligent lives. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to always bear in mind when someone asks another for help and support and grants them both are being strong. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to grow a resilient bond between our soul and our better angels in our work. Thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us to smile back at our work when it whispers to us, you're doing good. Y'all are doing good, we the peeps of Earth. And last but not least, thank you, Mother Earth, for teaching us when we help movements to free our people and free the planet, we are freeing ourselves. Thank you, Kelly, for an excellent uh, presentation. Hope you're back soon. And thank you, Mother Earth, for the cessation of excessive verbiage. <laughs> All right, David, go ahead. All right, David, go ahead. And we still are entertaining re rebuttals from the Zoom calls. To go ahead, Dave. All right. Um, one comment that was made on the screen there about nuclear missiles in the park. Actually, there were some at one point. Uh, closer to the mic. Yeah. Actually, there were some at one point. In 1951, not just in Chicago, but in cities all around the country, the federal government became concerned about the possibility that the Russians might send bombers over the North Pole. Are you talking in the microphone? I'm doing my best, Charlie. One pool at a time. All right, go ahead. Now, 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 the Russians became concerned that the Russians might send bombers over the North Pole. So they put nuclear tip anti aircraft missiles around all the major cities and major industrial sites in the country, including here in Chicago. And there were two such sites. One, the missiles were at Belmont Harbor, and the control station was at uh, at the beach at Montrose and Avenue. And the other missile base was at, at what now is the Bottle Lake Meadow in Jackson Park. And the control station for that was on the point down in Hyde Park. And these missiles were there, these Nike Zeus, the Nike Hercules missiles were there for about 20 years, from about 1951 until about 1971, when it become, had become obvious to all that the missiles were uploaded out of date and no longer necessary, and the missile sites were dismantled, and the land here in Chicago was returned to the Chicago Park District, ending, ending the, the missile sites in the parks. And that's the story behind that. How did everybody know they were out there? I don't know anybody. 
Um, that's well, it's, it's obvious that you don't know anything about this. Sure. Right. You know about the federal government figured out that they were out late, and that's why they and that's why they dismantled the missiles. All right, who's next? Thanks for the history. All right, who's next on the rebuttals? I guess I am. All right, go ahead. You got six minutes. <laughs> I could stick it in the middle there. Yeah, that's good. You refer to those Georgia sites as not operational yet. Unit three is operational, maybe not at hot, not at full power. You're talking about the light water reactor in Georgia, right? Yeah, the AP one thousand. Yes. And whether we're sorry that we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, we're not sorry. We did it and we're damn proud of doing it. And it ended the war. An invasion of Japan would have costed millions. It was not a mistake. And nuclear weapons actually prevented a World War III. Instead of a Cold War, we probably would have had a hot war. Nuclear weapons have saved lives. Oh, yeah. That's what I say. All right. So, who's next? Jake, you want to go ahead with a rebuttal? Unmute and go ahead. I'm, I muted you, Jake. So, go ahead. Jake. Jake, you got to unmute. Jake, you're, you're your hands up. And if you want to go, go. All right. Who's okay. Now can you now can now can you hear me? Now we can hear you, Jake. Okay. I I want to I want to just briefly rebut the last speaker. I've heard that story before. Um, the Manhattan Project was started by uh, was started uh, with a letter by Albert Einstein and a number of other scientists. It, or it was a pivotal letter towards Roosevelt, saying in so many words, "We have to make the bomb before the Germans do." Was intended as it was intended as a deterrent to the deterrent to the German bomb. After the main, um, uh, by 1943, it was deter the scientists determined that the Germans did not have did not have the technical technological capability of making the bomb. But by that time, it was the Hungarian scientists like Edward Teller who were, who were really controlling the whole thing. And it was decided, and so the question was asked: Okay, if, we're not, if if we no longer need a deterrence to the German bomb, then who should we target? They decided to target Japan. The idea was the the, the reason the, the Hungarian scientists were not into it out of fear of Hitler, but rather out of fear of Stalin. And so the the the, the point is that. The bombing of Hiroshima was not intended so much to punish the Japanese, but rather to scare the Soviets and keep them out of the Pacific. It was it was intended as a first strike against the Soviets. That's number one. Number two, when you're talking about Chernobyl reactors, um, most people don't know, don't understand those are really dual purpose reactors. It's an older reactor design. Those are military reactors designed for military purposes. The electricity is just a byproduct. In other words, in other words, the real purpose is to create plutonium for for atom bomb for atomic bomb production. The 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 electricity is just a byproduct. It, 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 it's a dual purpose reactor. All right, uh, Jan, you got You want to say something? Then we'll go to Charlie. Oh yeah, the uh, all of the reactors at um, uh, um, it, it, all the can do reactors, especially the first four or five of them, were all dual purpose. They were all uh, the purpose of the, them was to produce tritium and plutonium for the uh, so that um, Canada could sell it and make a profit. Uh, I uh, there's a, one of the very first books I read was called Atomic Accomplice, and Atomic Accomplice has been reissued with five new chapters, which I just downloaded and read part of today. And it, uh, Atomic Accomplice is about Canada's contribution to the fission project, project. And it is really, really amazing. 
And uh, okay, and then I wondered if since there seems to be some time left, you don't have to close until seven forty-five, right? Yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, Kelly wrote a really wonderful send up of uh, Dr. Zeus about nuclear waste. And um, it is so much fun. And I think it would be fun for Kelly and me to um, recite it for you because it was a real scream. <laughs> okay. Would that be okay? Uh, I, 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 as long as there's time. Would that have to be the grand finale or? Oh, or if there's time, we'll run it. Uh, uh, but I think Charlie's next. So go ahead, Charlie. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Nick Fox and Kelly. Very, very nice presentation and an overview of uh, the nuclear situation. I will address three issues. David, are you watching how I speak into the microphone? Can you hear me? All right. One. Uh, I heard a little earlier about why something about Jake was inquiring about uh, energy use for airplanes. I'll be discussing transportation on the 22nd. I will give you a little highlight though, is that unlike other forms of transportation, the amount of energy that is concentrated and necessary to maintain flight is disproportionate, unbelievably so, uh, to cheat light so much so that if you want to look at it from an energy perspective, you want to choose any other mode instead of air flight. It's just a, an incredibly energy consumption. It's just on a scale a hundred times easily more so than any other transit mode. So you have to think twice at, at, in terms of that as a as a as a prolific um, a popular mode of transportation, or else one that's confined to specific uh, situations, uh, it's it's simply not lending itself in any way to conservation efforts or alternative means. Uh, number two, I've heard this over and over again, and I'm going to lay this to rest. A thorium reactor is identical to any other reactor. Yeah. The only conceivable difference is, is in the startup process. And then you generate, like I put here tonight, it is not high pressure. And in fact, produces high pressure steam in order to turn a turbine. And that's how you have, there's only one way to generate. Yeah, I know that. There's only one way, Tim, to generate electricity is to boil water. And you also have a brain what you are doing, and you're not doing it efficiently. Um, so I, that's what I mean. I, I, I'm I, sorry, I'm gonna stand accused that you're perpetuating disinformation, sir. By leaving that out, that's directly a contradiction to the truth. I think now I'll come up here and tell me, my third point is, is that this is not dangerous. The things that emanate from a nuclear thorium reactor remain radioactive for a period of 400 years. Yep. That's a long time. That is dangerous substances. Do you have, have you ever looked up the permissible exposure level? Do you think you can be exposed to something radioactive at a scale like that, and you call it safe? What, sir, then is dangerous? What's dangerous? What is, is dangerous? That's not dangerous. And that's, that. this is with the level of radioactivity that you're dealing with, this level, 400 times, the ambient radioactivity of the earth. That's significant. 400 years to decay. It's just incredible. We're dealing with some very, very extreme here of nature. And to say that this is commonplace, I'm sorry, that's just not true. It's not accurate. We're dealing in an area that of the experimentation that normally would be labeled like science fiction. I don't think All right, so. thank you very much.
<laughs> coming in to clutch. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Andy. Yeah, about six minutes. We don't mind. We might have them uh, do their Dr. Seuss uh, nuclear wasting and then let Kelly uh, finish off. Hello? Hello? Oh, Jake, we're here. We got it. But uh, you've already asked questions. Or it's, uh, Andy's turn. Well, I, 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 want, I, I got another, I got another oh, rebuttal. Jake. 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 What? Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let somebody else go first, but I want another. I have another rebuttal, if I may. It's your third time, Jake. So. Okay, my time. Okay, okay, my my. Well, I, I asked a question before. I'll I'll ask it. I'll I'll say it again in another way. If 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 the people who are promoting the thorium reactors are so sure that it's cheap, then all the financial burden should be placed on the investors not on the taxpayers and not on the ratepayers, because otherwise what happens in the case of in the case of Commonwealth Edison is as an example is that they say it will be cheap and then our electric rates go up and up and up and up and every time they go before the le the, the legislature or the commerce commission or both they just rubber stamp everything that comrade wants and the ratepayers have have little or no voice so I mean, ratepayers are getting tired of that. So put all the finance. Fine, if you if you're so sure that thorium reactors will be cheap, put all the financial burden on on, on the investors, not on the ratepayers and not on the taxpayers. There's already six companies in the world working on them already to try to commercialize them that are completely uh, okay. 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 Based. Let the okay. Okay. Let the let the financial burden fall on uh, on the investors. They'll be soon enough. All right, uh, go. All right, uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Andy. Okay. And we'll let you. Uh, who, who? I'd like to make a couple of points uh, that haven't really been mentioned here tonight. Um, because there's, I brought, I pulled a few books off the shelf. My brother and I were digesting a book a week throughout the 70s and 80s. So I brought about 100 books on the database. It's a database on the hazards, economics, and nuclear power. Two of the very best books. One of them is called Energy and War, Breaking the Nuclear Link. The other one is called Brittle Power. Everything you need to know about why nuclear power can make no discernible contribution to solving the energy crisis. Number one, nobody's talking about the elephant in the room, which is Woodward and Bernstein gave us back in the 70s with Watergate. Follow the money. Follow the money. <laughs> Nobody that's looking to make a profit generating electricity is talking about building any kind of nuclear power plant. They are not for selling electricity for a profit. They are propped up with government welfare money. Nobody in the right mind, no investors in this country, and no insurance companies are going to insure any kind of nuclear power plant especially with the report that came out today that says uh, half the nuclear power plants in the world are going to be uh, affected by climate change, loss of water, all atmospheric conditions, floods, storms, whatever, over the next two years, uh, two decades. There's a movie called In the Heat of the Night. And there's a great scene in there where Sidney Poitier, the detector, is arguing with the sheriff. The sheriff says, I got the man in jail that did the murder. I got the body, I got the money, and I got the motive. And Sidney keeps saying, you have the wrong man. You have the, and you know, Rock Steiger played the sheriff and he's getting red in the face and says, I got everything. What are you saying that I got the wrong man? Sidney says, Sam couldn't have driven two cars at the same time. He says, oh. It's a light bulb moment. Well, these books give you a light bulb moment when you understand that the nuclear weapons industry worldwide exists on uranium and plutonium. If you shut down the nuclear power industry, like they said, and this is one of the first things Henry and others back in the 60s said, 
shut down the nuclear power industry if you want to get rid of the atomic energy problem of uh, nuclear weapons worldwide. If no country is ha has nuclear reactors, then anybody mining uranium, they're going to know they're running a bond program. That's how you get rid of the nuclear weapons program nationwide, is to shut down the nuclear power industry worldwide. Now, second point, everybody hear it over and over again. When I say follow the money, we have a prostitution problem in America. I'm not talking about Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump. <laughs> other kind of prostitutes that are in universities. There's a thousand of them, professors. It's called pay to play. They're pay a professor can be paid $250,000 to produce a report. And then give another quarter of a million dollars to testify before Congress to enter that into the record. And this is how disinformation gets entered into the congressional record and promoted nationwide. And uh, of course, congressional committees do it too. They lie to us about JFK. They lie to us about Vietnam. They lie to us about the hunt for nuclear terrorist bombs in American cities. They lie to us about uh, the prospect of a, a Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. Check out the movie The China Syndrome. That movie came out two weeks before Three Mile Island, and Three Mile Island was a mirror image of what they talked about in that movie. Follow the money. At today's current prices, if you want to get a megawatt of electricity, solar and wind power will cost you no more than a tenth of building any kind of nuclear reactor. And you can get that, that megawatt worth of electricity online in one tenth or one twentieth of time in months or years that it would take to get a nuclear reactor on. Those are the actual actual numbers. Even, even if they you can mass produce nuclear power plants, modular reactors, they're still going to be five to ten times more per kilowatt than the current solar and wind farms. And Look up the new investment that's being hawked by the Wall Street investors. It's called SWAB, Gold 2.0, the next gold rush. SWAB means solar, wind, and batteries. There's a big utility scale batteries come online. Uh, cities and towns all over the world are able to provide up to 24 hour power from solar and wind. You don't have to burn coal. Now that's happening now. That's not in the future. So, it's a giant, giant piece of disinformation to say that solar and wind can't provide our needs. They already are providing the needs of hundreds of millions of people made all over the world, and it's growing. Follow the money. People are paid to produce. I would like to see who's supporting authority in the last, because it can't be anybody that's familiar with uh, the, the last 50 books that have been published by hundreds of scientists showing that nuclear power has absolutely no chance of competing with renewables at current prices, much less as, as uh, nuclear energy materials get more expensive and you have to guard that stuff. One, one final thing, John Goffman published a book called Poison Power. And he said the nuclear power cycle poisons and kills people with radioactive waste and poison and uh, exposure at every level. She talked about the uranium mine and the Indians. Now they never hear about Indian reservations and what kind of problems they have with stillborn babies and everything else around the uranium mine. It's a toxic waste. I just I was poking through one of these books from 19, Ernest Sternglass wrote a book called Secret Fallout. And he said, he ran across a statistic that SAT scores from high school students graduating, the SAT scores dropped about 10%, a precipitous drop in 1975, that one year. And he couldn't figure out you know, what was going on because it didn't get there. And he thought to himself, what year was their atmospheric testing? That was 1957. The last year was when we banned atmospheric testing. Then the one year they had a lot going in the atmosphere. 18 years later, those kids were in the womb, their mother's womb, when the, and that gas was going around, it caused a drop. We saw it statistically, kids were less intelligent than uh, 
during the years when we didn't have atmospheric testing. And the one, one if, you, if you didn't know about it, all the radioactive testing stations, air monitoring stations on the west coast of the United States were closed right after the Fukushima reactor accident happened. When the winds began blowing that stuff out of Japan, they had to close down the radioactive radiation stations monitoring our west coast because the infant mortality rate went up. Every time you have a nuclear accident, the infant mortality rate goes up statistically, even if it doesn't kill a bunch of people right there. So there's, there's, there's 10 different reasons. Any one of them would just devastate any plan to build any kind of nuke. So the only people that are planning on building nukes are being people that are being paid to lie to us. And they, it, lie. they're paid to lie to us, and it sucks in other well-meaning people. At one time, I thought nuclear power and electricity was an end-all, be-all before I started reading and learn. But what can we say to people that would just absolutely refuse to look at the evidence is totally overwhelming. Nuclear is dead, dead, dead. And the only they're being propped up, she mentioned $7 billion or something. Nuclear plants operating in the United States are being propped up with taxpayer welfare. That's the only reason many of them are still open, is because they're not competitive. Common in this book, Commonwealth Edison was listed in 1980 as technically bankrupt with no hope of paying for their nuclear program through the sale of electricity. They've been back with taxpayer slush money for you know, any way you slice it. It's been nuclear welfare for the people that build nuclear power plants. It's not a competitive source of electricity. They're not safe, they're not clean, they're not too cheap to me. And that, I'm sorry, that's, that's just like saying the earth is flat, the earth is round. One, one of those statements is false and one is true. Can you imagine, hey, hey Charlie, get some in here from the flat earth and say, we still got some people. Let's have a debate. Let's see people what a debate looks like with the flat <laughs> versus round earthers. And who are you gonna, they're, 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 they had a flat earth uh, society meeting in Denver, uh, three day symposium on the flat earth society. There's a book on it, how to talk to a science denier. They got a flat earth society. These people think the earth is flat. What are we gonna do with that? We're gonna charge a nuclear power plant? I don't think so. <laughs> That's all I have tonight. All right. It's a rebuttal. Okay. A rebuttal, it's a rebuttal, Andy. Yeah. Okay. Um, just give me a minute. The average dumb student American can understand what that guy just said. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a founding member of the Flat Earth Society. We can we can tell by the way you interrupt all the time, but never mind. Your freedoms are welcome here. Yeah, your freedoms are welcome here. All right, uh, seeing as how that's the end of the rebuttal period, uh, Aww. Aww. I'm going to give you the last word and uh, go ahead and uh, you, the floor is yours. You'll get a chance to. You can either just say good night or rebut everybody here, but the floor we is yours. You get... What? You get the last. Let Kelly speak for another hour. She's a good speaker. All right, so uh, floor is yours, Kelly. <laughs> um, you get the last word. Jan, should we uh, maybe do the radioactive eggs and ham at the end? Well, we've got 20 minutes. Do you want to do you, uh, does Charlie object? No. We want to hear the eggs and ham bit. All right, okay. the eggs and ham bit I'll, it is. Okay, I'm gonna I, I'll, I get I'll, two minutes to sing. I'll do the um the Do you have uh, do you have your copy? No. Can oh, you share uh, yours on, well, the, on the screen? Him, him, can I share screen? Or uh, you could email yeah, it. You can go ahead and share screen, Jen. Okay. Share screen. All right. Should should I do my rebuttals first and get that part over? I don't I don't think we'll have time. But well, uh, why don't we let Kelly speak then, Jan? We'll do it some other time. Oh, okay. I'll I'll be brief. If you'll be brief, then we'll get the then we'll get to Jan. Okay, and we have 20, 19 more minutes. Is that right? Uh, roughly 16, 17. Okay. Um, okay, so regarding somebody asked 
very early on about the nuclear weapons treaty ban enforcement. Um, and I was thinking about it since then that, um, you know, it's going to fall under the category of all the other weapons that have been banned, like chemical, biological, cluster munitions. Nobody's using these things right now. Um, they're very highly stigmatized. So <clears throat> I think the stigmatization is almost as powerful as what an enforcement agency could do. Um, Thorium, I think you have, it sounds like you must talk about this a lot there and have very educated people. Um, I think the biggest problem with it is just right now unproven. I mean, there are so many things that sound like it could, it's an, you know, it's an amazing idea. Um, just unproven, there still needs so much uh, research to be done before it could be feasible to use. Um, let's see here, I'll share this. Um, so one of the one of the very early um, reactors, and this is a melted core of the experiment breeder molten sodium reactor in 1955. Um, there have been there's been a lot of research done on thorium uh, reactors for decades, as you said, <coughs> and um, it hasn't it hasn't worked, um, and it just it just doesn't seem like right now is the time to continue to pour billions of dollars into something that's not proven right now at the at this point in the climate crisis. Um, Hiroshima. <coughs> so yourself. Hiroshima was um, somebody else already rebutted the sort of the motivations for why Hiroshima um, was not uh, what and the bombing of Hiroshima was not what ended the war. There are also a lot of military personnel and uh, po um, political officials at the time that acknowledged that it was not what ended the war. Um, it was known a couple weeks before the bomb was dropped that uh, the emperor, emperor was ready to uh, surrender. Um, it was, um, and there are, okay. So other people who have said things about, about the, the motivation. Um, 1946 US Strategic Bombs Bombing Survey led by Dr. Paul Nietzsche, who would later become Navy Secretary, and um, then what was a presidential advisor, Ronald Reagan. Um, he did a big study which um, demolished Truman's uh, public re relations saying that, yeah, this is what ended the war. He said Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no invasion had been planned or contemplated. And um, that is in a, a book called The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb in the Architecture of the American Myth by Gar Alperovitz. Um, also a 1946 report of the intelligence group of the War Department, which is now the Pentagon, um, the Military Intelligence Division was which this was discovered in 1989. The conclusion was that the atomic bombings had not been needed to end the war. The intelligence group that judged that it was almost a certainty that the Japanese would have capitulated upon the entry of Russia into the war. Um, that is, that's a quote. Uh, Major General Curtis LeMay made a um, statement six weeks after the Nagasaki bomb. Um, he headed the 21st Bomber Command and directed the firebombing of Osaka, Tokyo, and 58 other Japanese cities. May said September 20th of 1945 at a New York press conference, the war would have been over within two weeks without the Russians entering and without an atomic bomb. Um, so he says, uh, a surprise reporter asked, had they not surrendered because of the bomb? And he answered, LeMay answered, the atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war at all. Um, so it's been, you know, we want to be proud of our history and it's hard when we hear, hear hard things like that, um, but this is just some more of the facts. Okay, sorry, that was a little long. I'm gonna, um, maybe you got the chance to pick up um, some Nuke Watch newsletters. Uh, I sent them and um, they should be available there at Dappers. I don't yes, know if they are. They're already okay. passed out. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, 
take a look at this. It, talk, it talks about the whole range of issues I've discussed tonight and much more. And um, if you're interested in getting it in your mailbox, turn to page seven. It has our address, um, phone number, email, get in contact and we can add your address to our list so you can keep getting this in your mailbox. Oop, I'm disappearing. Um, every three months, you watch quarterly. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Jen, do you, can you do your, so we, we, can you do your thing in less than uh, 10 minutes? I don't think so. Do you, Kelly? How do you think? How let's, much? let's do, um, let's do the first half. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Jan and I met in Minneapolis in 2017, maybe the, um, the department of energy was having meetings to, um, <laughs> to look for a place to, to store all of our radioactive waste from commercial radio um, power, nuclear power. And I interrupted, we interrupted the, um, we interrupted the meeting, the Department of Energy meeting to read this to them. And in the video of the Department of Energy, they cut out this part of the, of the video and also of the transcript. But we interrupted their meeting to read this. Um, so you get the idea. Nobody wants radioactive waste. Go uh, ahead. Well, can we, can we, uh, sh can I share screen? Yeah, you should be able to. I was able to. The oh. green. Can go right ahead. You should be able to do it right at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you want to be DOE or? or the non-consenting volunteer? I always like to be the bad guy. I'll be the DOE. <laughs> okay, go for it. I am the DOE, the DOE I am. That DOE, that DOE. I do not like en nuclear energy. Do you like radioactive waste? <laughs> I don't like radioactive waste. Would you like it here or there? I, let's see here. I would not like it. I would not like it here or there. I would not like it anywhere. Stop making radioactive waste. I do not like it any place. Would you like it in Massachusetts? Would you like it at Yucca Mountain? I would not like it in Massachusetts. I would not like it at Yucca Mountain. I do not like it here or there. I do not like it anywhere. Stop making radioactive waste. I do not like it any place. Would you take it in Minnesota? Would you take it in Arizona? Not Minnesota, not Arizona, not Massachusetts, not Yucca Mountain. I would not take it here or there. I would not take it anywhere. Stop making radioactive waste. I do not like it any place. Waste control specialist is in this biz. Take it, take it, here it is. No, we cannot take their bids. Texas does not want this for their kids. A train, a train, a train, a train. Would you haul it on a train? Not on a train, not through our yard, not on a truck. You make this hard. I would not, could not in Minnesota. I could not, would not in Arizona. I will not take it in Massachusetts. I will not take it to Yucca Mountain. I will not take it here or there. I will not take it anywhere. Stop making radioactive waste. I do not like it any place. <laughs> could you, would you in a borehole? I would not, could not in a borehole. What if it's safe and under control? I would not, I could not, would not in a borehole. It is not safe or under control. I will not take it on a train. You should not drive it through the rain, not on a truck, not next to me, not through my yard. You let me be. I do not like it in Arizona. I do not like it in Ma Minnesota. I will not take it in Massachusetts. I will not take it to Yucca Mountain. I do not like it here or there. I do not like it anywhere. Stop making radioactive waste. I do not like it any place. You do not like it, so you say, what shall we do to save the day? Stop making radioactive waste. Don't transport it all over the place. Keep it on site and save the human race. Oh. <laughs> that last part's a reference to a potential solution called hardened on-site storage. Oh, and that was the one, that was the one talk I gave at uh, College of Complex about hardened on-site storage. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so we're going to stop the share. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Oh. That was fun. <laughs> so what uh, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I put radioactive waste on my salad? 
if you want. <laughs> what yeah. flavor? I think we're done, Tim. Yeah. Hi. Can you um can you quick can you uh quickly give me uh contact information for new, for new watch, uh, phone number phone number or email address? I'm gonna I'll put it up for everyone. Yeah, I'm on I'm on the phone, I'm not on a computer. Oh, sorry. So oh yeah, it. sorry. Okay, so um our phone I'll, number I'll, just, I'll send Jake a copy and then he can look on page seven. Oh yeah. Our phone number is 715-472. Whoops, four seven two. Yeah. Four one eight five. Okay. Four one eight five. Seven one five four seven two four one eight five. Okay. And that's the office number? Yeah. Do you want to email? Yeah, okay. And where is that? The email address? Yeah. I mean, okay. where are you in Wisconsin, right? Northwestern Wisconsin, Luck. Okay. It's very oh, rural. Okay. Okay. Email. What's the email? Uh huh. Nukewatch1 at Lakeland. Dot w -S. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll spell it. Yep. N U K E. Yeah. W A T C H, the number one. At. One. Okay. Yeah. At Lakeland. Yeah. L A K E. Yeah. L uh -huh. L A K E L A N D. Yeah. Dot W S, like Wisconsin W S. Dot what? Oh, dot dot W S. Okay. Okay, I got you. Okay. All right, thank you. So, um, what other programs do you do? Nuke Watch. Oh, what? Yeah. What do we? Oh, oh man, I forgot to say this one. So, um, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, Ukraine is surrounded by nuclear weapons, U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe, U.S. And right. somebody else mentioned them too. Um, so we're we are we have a campaign to try to get those back off of foreign soil. The U.S. is the only country with nuclear weapons currently in other countries. We don't want to be that first person and first country and be a bad example for other countries like Russia is talking about now. Um, but unfortunately, we have been. And um, so we have a, we're trying to get U.S. nuclear weapons off of German soil um, is our campaign right now, but it's in third five other countries. And then we're also working in solidarity with, well, working to try to make sure this radioactive waste from nuclear power plants does not end up being an environmental injustice um, through the our um, work in the coalition, the um, National Radioactive Waste Coalition. And then we're also, we support um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Nuclear Ban Treaty. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Jerry, I'd like to say thank you again for coming yourself. I know you've been here in person a few times. So with that, the College of Complexes is adjourned. Yay. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks for all the great questions, everybody. <laughs> Sounds like a okay. great Who wants to be the host now? I can have you guys keep going for a little while. If not, uh, Janet, you know how to operate Zoom, right? Oh, 